following this talk, there will be an opportunity to ask Dr. Simmons questions. Please submit your questions during the talk um, using the chat function. And I will then try and collate your questions and put them to Dr. Simmons on your behalf once she has presented. Now, this leads me to warmly welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Eva Simmons, who will very soon be a visiting scholar at Lucy Cavendish College. Dr. Simmons was the first undergraduate to be accepted at Lucy Cavendish College in 1972, and she graduated in 1975 with a BA Honours in English Literature. She is now a journalist, a well-traveled journalist and academic. Dr. Simmons has lived in the United States and has presented on a New York radio station and reported on race and civil rights issues for newspapers in Chicago. She has also worked for the BBC as a broadcast journalist for 25 years. And during that time, also has done some stints teaching journalism to the BBC World Service in Romania, Malawi. She has also worked for the British Library Oral History Department, interviewing people about their lives. Dr. Simmons has a long-standing interest in intercultural matters and has studied interfaith relations at the Wolf Institute in Cambridge. Following this, she's also collaborated with a Muslim colleague, giving talks to local children and adults. It is this latter interest that has informed her latest project, a book called A Slave to Love, Muslim Christian Encounters in the Literature. And tonight's Life from Lucy talk draws on this research um, that she undertook for this book. So now, without any further ado, please warmly welcome Dr. Simmons. Dr. Simmons, the floor, or maybe the screen, is all yours. Thank you very much, Henrietta. You're welcome. Um, and will... you're going to share the screen, right? Exactly. So when we think about Muslim women from times past, we may imagine them secluded and downtrodden restricted in their movements and completely subject to the men in their sphere, fathers, brothers, husbands and rulers. Those are the images that many people in the West have about women of the East. But in many works of medieval literature, there are examples of fiery, independent Muslim women who fight for their cause, just as the Prophet Muhammad's young widow Aisha did, leading her troops into battle on the back of a camel. And there you have a picture of Aisha in her howdah, heavily veiled on the back of a camel and surrounded by her attendants and her soldiers. Aisha was not the only warrior woman of the Prophet's day. There were others, both among his followers and his enemies. These were real life women, so far as we know, whose exploits are noted in Islamic records. But there were also many such women fighters celebrated in fiction. And in fact, they're so numerous and impressive, there is actually a book about them called The Warrior Women of Islam, Female Empowerment in Arabic Literature by a Dutch scholar called Remke Kruk. And there you should see in a moment the cover of her book. Uh, it's a very fine book, quite groundbreaking. Um, covering material that most people in the West know nothing about, I would say. The Warrior Women of Islam focuses on women in Arabic literature, but this evening my own focus will be on their counterparts in European literature, and specifically that of France and England. I first got interested in medieval warrior women when I began researching stories featuring love affairs between Christians and Muslims from the Middle Ages onwards. I was primarily interested in the ones that end happily, so to speak. In other words, they end with the love of getting married and living, one hopes, happily ever after, which may not be everyone's idea of a happy ending, but I think the authors and audiences probably 
did think so. And I preferred those to the many tragedies in which most people end up dead, typically stabbed or headless or both by the conclusion of the work. Now, to my surprise, I discovered that there are lots of these interfaith romances and they feature in both Christian and Muslim literature. I found that in most of the texts, when the lovers first get together, there's an obvious attraction of opposites. But before they can be united, one of them has got to convert to the religion of the other. Not surprisingly, perhaps in Muslim literature, the Christian converts to Islam. And in Christian literature, you get it, you get the opposite, the Muslim converts to Christianity and life being what it is and was, that usually meant the woman converting to the religion of the man. That wasn't invariably the case, uh, but mostly, and I'm not going to talk now about the ones in which the men converted, it's a different kind of pattern. Portrayals of clever and resourceful young women in the Muslim world go back into antiquity. The best known of these is Shahrazad, as we call it, Shahrazad, from the Thousand and One Nights or Arabian Nights, spinning her tales to her murderous husband, Shahriar, to save her own life and the lives of potentially many other maidens whom he would have killed had she not been there. And we'll see in a moment uh, a picture of Shahrazad and Shahriar. Um. Sorry, um, my computer doesn't want to play ball at the moment, so... Okay, well, I'll yeah. carry on, shall I? Shahrazad is very courageous, but she's not a warrior, and only her wits and eloquence can save her. There you have a picture of Shahrazad and the Sultan. She's holding her book of stories. He actually is also holding the book of stories, which is interesting, but you can see that they're very engrossed in one another. There you have another uh, image of Shahrazad testifying to the enduring popularity of the stories, uh, set designs for the ballet by Leon Bakst from a performance in 1910, music by Rimsky Korsakov. Now, as I said, Shahrazad herself is not a warrior, but the women in the stories I'm talking about are often politically powerful as well as physically strong. They're frequently women of high rank and many of them are queens and princesses. Arab legendary women tend to be tomboys in their youth. As adults, they're of course beautiful, all heroines of myths and stories are beautiful but also physically stronger than men, which is really interesting. They're skilled in the martial arts and they are ruthless, seducing and killing with abandon as required by the situation. And in a moment, we'll have a picture of an Arab warrior woman, I hope. Princess Mihradukht from the Persian adventures of Hamza. There she is, Princess Mihradukht. And she's, as you can see, she's beautifully addressed, uh, beautifully dressed, veiled and brightly colored uh, dress or top, hair very ornately styled. And she seems to have a little beauty spot, but she is in the process of firing an arrow from her bow, which tells you that she is dangerous as well as beautiful. One of the best known of the warrior women's stories in the Middle East is called Sirat Alamira Vat Al Himma. Sira means story, biography of, etc., which is also shortened to Vat Al Himma, Del Himma, or Del Hema, which is the name of the heroine. And there you have the cover of a book which is coming out later this year, The Tale of Princess Fatima, Warrior Woman. And you can see that Vat Al Himma is also very beautifully and colourfully dressed, uh, astride a beautifully uh, attired horse uh, rising up, but she's holding this deadly weapon over her head, a scimitar or something, and she has a fierce and lethal expression in her eyes. That al Himma lives to fight, mostly against Byzantine Christians and to promote the cause of Islam. She's not interested in marriage, although she does eventually marry against her will, I'm sorry to say. 
a fellow warrior, and she has a child who also becomes a hero of the story, Abdul Wahab. A number of warrior women in Arab literature begin their careers as Christians. The Thousand and One Nights includes a story called The Tale of Umar ibn al-Nu'uman and his sons, in which a Christian warrior princess, Abrisa, repeatedly defeats the Muslim king's son, Sharkan, in combat. Actually, she wrestles him. And each time she does so, he is so overcome by the warmth and perfume of her body close to his that he completely submits. But she eventually falls in love with him and abandoning her own people, joins her fate to his and with him fights against Christians who'd formerly been her own people. And here we have a picture of Abrisa defeating Sharkan, a 19th century illustration. You can see that she's very sexy. She's also quite athletic looking. And Sharkan has had it. I mean, he's completely overcome. He's not going anywhere. Another story, the story of Ali Nuruddin and Miriam the sash maker, another one in which a Christian born woman falls in love with a Muslim man and he with her. In this story, she's already converted to Islam when they meet. Uh, although Miriam, when the story begins, is a slave, she is actually a princess and her master values her so highly that when he sells her, he allows her to choose her own next master, which she duly does. And you can imagine how unusual that sort of situation is. And here we have a picture of Miriam surrounded by men. I think that's probably an image from the slave market. The men are all uh, discussing, debating probably her price and her worth. And Nuruddin's either in the background or nowhere to be seen at all, because in fact, he, he doesn't come forward to bid for her. She spots him at the back of the crowd and she calls out to him, hey, you, come and bid for, you, for me. I want you to buy me so that she can be with him. And he uses his every last penny or whatever his currency is to buy her and to take her home. Having chosen Ali Nuruddin, she now becomes the brains for both of them. She's tougher and cleverer than the feckless Ali Nuruddin. In one episode, she captains a ship disguised as a man and warrior woman that she is. She kills anyone who gets in the way of her and Nuruddin's happiness. And I think that includes all her shipmates and even her own brothers. Well, now to the warrior women's counterparts in European literature. Many of the stories I'm dealing with go back to an 11th century French poem called the Chanson de Roland, the Song of Roland. This work is known as a chanson de geste, meaning an epic story that's mostly about heroic deeds and warfare. It concerns a historic battle at Roncesvalles or Roncesvaux on the French-Spanish border in which the Frankish king, king Charlemagne fights the Saracen leader Marsile aided by his 12 paladins. That's his favorite knights, his bodyguard who are always around him. And the most famous of these is Roland, Roland, hence the title of the work. Marsile's wife is Bramimonde. And here we have a picture of the battle at Roncesvalles. You can see bodies, men and armor and weapons and horses all closely embroiled in battle. And down at the front, a knight who's already been felled and is looking rather the worse for wear with his sword stuck in the ground, useless beside him. Marsile, that's the Saracen king's wife, is Bramimonde, and when he's clearly losing, she herself loses faith in Islam and converts to Christianity. Her part in the poem is relatively unimportant, and romance also plays a minor role, although the scene in which Bramimonde abandons her faith and reluctantly converts is a symbolically significant one. But in several other Christian romances concerning the trials and victories of Charlemagne and his men, the Muslim woman is an eroticized figure who acts on her own initiative and her deeds are central 
to the resolution of the action. Such a one is Floripas, who will occupy the rest of my talk. She's a recurring figure in European literature of the Middle Ages, and her fiery character, at first staunchly Muslim, and then, once she's converted, resolutely Christian, was fascinating to medieval readers and audiences. And there we have a picture of, she's described in the text as fair, I've called her fiery Floripas, uh, an image taken from a medieval verse, in itself taken from another one, written in about 1155. And this picture is extracted from a bigger one, which I'll show you presently. Floripas's interstitial role between the two worlds, Christian and Muslim, makes her critical to the action in whichever work she appears. Now, I'm going to talk about three different versions of her story and to show how her character changes over time between the 12th century when the first one was written and the 15th when the third was written. An early version of Floripas' story is called Fierabra, translated from French into English as Sir Ferrambras. Fierabra is Floripas's gigantic brother, and they are both children of the Saracen ruler Balan, who's been fighting the Christian forces of Charlemagne. And there you can see the gigantic brother, heavily armed, on a rearing charger uh, with a very lethal looking scimitar over his head and a fierce expression on his whiskered and bearded face. The Saracens attack Rome and it is in that city that Floripas, traveling with the Saracen army, sees and falls in love with the Frankish, that's to say the French knight Guy de Bourgogne, Guy of Burgundy. She goes over to the Christian side converts to their religion, and when Guy and four of his companions are captured by the Saracens, she rescues them. Eventually, Fierabra is defeated, and he too converts to Christianity. There are two versions of Fierabra still in existence, one originally written in French about 1170, the other in Provençal, and then translated into various other languages. Both are thought to be based on a lost French original. Like their forebear, the Chansons de Roland, these chansons de geste are full of savage and bloodthirsty accounts of fighting, maiming and killing. But what they all have in common is the character of Floripas and the role she plays in resolving the actions. She and her initiatives are among the few constant and essential factors in all the stories. Now, it's interesting that Floripas, despite her martial qualities, shares with a number of other medieval characters in tales of Muslim Christian warfare, a floral name, and one also associated with Easter. Floripas is thought to be an equivalent of Passafleur, which as one editor translates it means wood anemone. In another instance, Floripas is associated with the peach blossom, Fleur de Pesquier, uh, and she's also associated with the passion flower, Passiflora, and the Passion and by extension, Easter time, the time of the Passion. Floripas is also described as a maid fair and sweet in Sir Ferenbras and a maid fair and gentle. But in her actions, Floripas reveals a tough Amazonian side, making her ferocious as an opponent, especially in furtherance of her love interest. In fact, she is a version viewed from a Christian perspective of some of the previously mentioned warrior women of Islam, such as the fierce Muslim convert Miriam in the story of Ali Nuruddin and Miriam the Sashmaker, and Abrisa of Umar ibn al-Numan and his sons. Now, having fallen completely for Guy de Bourgogne and gone over to the Frankish side, Floripas instructs the Christian knights how to find and kill the Saracens. And who better than she to know where the Saracens are, what their tactics are, and, uh, and how they can be overcome. Some of the Christians are captured and she goes to the dungeon hoping to rescue them, but she is refused entry to the dungeon where they're being held. And there you can see her listening outside the prison, trying to figure out where in the prison the knights might be and how she can get in and uh, how she can rescue them, but she's being 
forbidden to go in. So what should she do? Obvious, she murders the jailer, Britterman. And uh, in a moment, we should see a, an image of that, of her uh, killing the jailer. There you are, so you can see her tall and statuesque, looking a bit miserable, but otherwise quite calm. And she's whacking the jailer and he's anything but calm. He's in his death throes and uh, having a rather thin time of it. But one of the accounts says that she hit him so hard that his eyes jumped out of his head. Another one that she hit him so ferociously that his brains leapt out of his head. Uh, either way, not very pleasant. Uh, later, her governess gets in her way and also tries to prevent her going to rescue the prisoners. Uh, so what does she do? She lures the government to a window and in one version she pushes her out of the window in the uh, water to drown. In another version she gets one of her attendants to do it and thus in a single scene she removes all obstacles to her aims which are to rescue the Frankish knights and to marry Guy de Bourgogne. Of course when her father realizes Britterman's dead she has some explaining to do and here we see Floripas and her father in rather animated conversation. With the ruthless zeal of the convert, Floripas is also merciless in her treatment of her father. No family mediation service here, I'm afraid. Balan refuses to be baptized and Ferenbras pleads with the Frankish emperor for him to be given another chance. But his sister Floripas dismisses his appeals and remonstrates with the emperor. Uh, why tarriest thou so longer with that man that hath thee and thine aggraved? Why do you waste so much time with that man who's wronged you and yours? It's all for nothing. You will never bring him to your purpose. Balan remains obdurate and is beheaded at the king's command and with no regrets on the part of his daughter. At the end of Sir Ferenbras, Floripas strips off naked in order to be baptised. Now I couldn't find a picture of her being baptised, but this is another uh, story, Baptism of a Saracen Princess, and you can see that she's naked and she's managed somehow to get into uh, that big basin and is having oil or oil and water, holy water, poured over her and I just hope the water is a bit warm not freezing cold which wouldn't be too much fun. Her stripping off naked precipitates a rapturous description of her beauty by the narrator. Her skin was as white as milk foam, there was none fairer in the world with eyes grey and brows bowed and fair tresses beautifully quaffed. It says in the original fair e trent which means done up. Each hair seemed to be made of gold, her face was fair and slender, her body gentle and perfectly proportioned and handsome her stature. In all the world there was no fairer woman of flesh and bone than was that creature. So Floripas is baptised, Charlemagne then orders Guy de Bourgogne to marry her which he's previously agreed to do gladly, but in fact, that's not really quite correct because he uh, initially he's rather reluctant and he has to be persuaded to marry her. She and Guy are crowned. Spain is then divided between Guy and Floripas brother, Ferenbras, who's converted to Christianity. And you, here you see uh, the baptism of Sir Ferenbras converting to Christianity, not quite so fair and gentle, but absolutely stark as apart from his headgear. And he's getting ready to climb into that big butt of water. Floripas has one other important role in the narrative, and that is to return to the Christians, the sacred relics which Ferenbras had stolen from Jerusalem and carried off to his father Balan. That is the relics associated with the crucifixion, crown of thorns and uh, uh, probably bits of wood from the true cross and all the rest of it. 
And she does that, she hands the relics over. Now, the second version of the story I'm going to talk about is called the Sowden of Babylon. Sowden means Sultan, Sowden of Babylon, and of Ferenbrassi's son who conquered Rome. And there are two different book covers of a modern reprint of a 19th century edition. In this version of the story from the late 14th or early 15th century, the character of Floripas father, here the Sowden or Sultan of the title, is made more evil. He repeatedly curses his daughter, tries to force her to watch her lover Guy de Bourgogne's execution. He doesn't actually succeed in getting Bourgogne, Guy de Bourgogne executed, but he has a good go. And her character is softened by contrast. For example, despite his hostility towards her, Floripaz welcomes her father with right good cheer when he's brought in as a captive to Charles, but he again curses her. I actually think he might have good reason to curse her, but there we are in the story. It's not uh, presented as a very nice thing to do. In many other respects, the two stories, that's to say Sir Ferenbras and the romance of the Southern of Babylon are comparable. As in Sir Ferenbras, Floripas gives succor, that's support to the Frankish prisoners whom she's rescued and gives them shelter in her tower chamber. And there you can see the Frankish knights at the top of the tower clutching their, um, their relics with the Saracens besieging down below and trying to find a way to get into the tower. This, I think, is a neat reversal of the usual fairy tale trope of the maiden incarcerated in a tower from which she's rescued by a man. Also, the manner of the knight's rescue, the letting down of a rope from Floripas apartments with which she and her maidens draw the knights up, seems to me a deliberate twist on the folktale motif of the knight drawn up by a rope or a rope substitute, as in Rapunzel, where the rope is the girl's own hair. And you can see in a minute, there we have Rapunzel letting down her hair. Do you remember the refrain? Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. And the hair, her long hair plaited becomes the rope up which the man will climb. But he, he in Rapunzel, he is climbing up to be with her, but also in hopes of rescuing her. Whereas here, the knights are being drawn up by the women for their own salvation, for the knights' own salvation by the women, so Floripas can protect them. Also, the description of the opulence of Floripas' apartments, which are sumptuously adorned with precious stones, gold and silver gilt, according to the text, richly embroidered with cloth and the like, evokes that in many a description of a harem. And here we have a 19th century painting by John Frederick Lewis, British artist. It's called The Reception or Lady Receiving Visitors, but it's often interpreted as a harem scene. Uh, you can see that all the people in the scene are women, apart from tiny gazelle on the right-hand side, obviously a pet, and a couple of male servants um, who look very young, uh, younger than the women. And you can see how, how beautiful and luxurious the setting is with wonderful stained glass and high ceilings with uh, oak beams, a pool in the middle of the room to keep things cool in the heat of the summer, oriental rugs and all the rest of it. A really lovely, luxurious scene. Now this would again, I think, be a twist on a convention because the harem is built to confine and contain women in luxury intended mainly for the male owner's pleasure. But here it is for Floripas alone. Also the 15 maidens with whom Floripas lives are not fellow wives or concubines, but attendants on herself, a princess there to do her bidding, not the bidding of a man. Now, the third and last version of Floripas' story, which I'm going to talk about today, is the life of the noble and Christian prince Charles the Great. Charles the Great is a term for Charlemagne, which actually means Charles the Great, translated into early modern English and printed by the famous William Caxton in 1485. And there we have a picture of 
of Caxton, um, a 20th century picture, but I think based on a much older image, the engraving is by somebody called R.H. Sommer, 1921, but I think the image is probably centuries older than that, and the main thing Sommer's done is just add colour to it because the original was in black and white. Now, interestingly, given the hero of the story, Guy of Burgundy, Caxton's trade brought him into contact with Burgundy, and he actually joined the household of Margaret, Duchess of Burgundy, for a time. I think that's probably a coincidence, but it's an interesting little fact. Charles the Great is substantially different from both Sir Ferenbra and the Southern of Babylon, although the story is essentially the same. Caxton introduces Charles the Great as giving examples and models of behavior to show people reading it or watching it, listening to it, how to live, meaning fighting for and adhering to the Christian faith. Of all the works I've talked about so far, this is the most overtly religious, not only narrating a series of battles between two peoples inspired by different faiths, but mapping a meta struggle for spiritual, no less than geographical dominion. In other words, like a battle, uh, between the two religions themselves, a battle for hearts and minds. Medieval Europeans, or many of them, had no understanding of Islam whatsoever. They believed it to be a polytheistic religion, which of course it isn't, with the prophet Muhammad being one of its many gods, which I don't have to tell you, he wasn't. And so in earlier works, the Saracens worship a mishmash of supposed Muslim and Greek gods in the form of idols, including Mahoun, that's what they call Muhammad, Termagant, Margot, Apollin, and Eupin, which is Jupiter, Apollo and Jupiter. When the Christian God or Jesus Christ is invoked by the Franks, the suppliants are invariably successful. At times, God performs miracles to save them. But the Saracens' appeals to their gods invariably fail. And the Muslim gods are even put to work on behalf of the Franks who get hold of the idols and use them as weapons, hurling them from their tower into the ranks of the besieging Saracens. From a modern perspective, the Franks are absolutely ruthless in forcing a choice between conversion and death. And here's a, a line from the book. Then the battle took an ender and he that would not be converted was incontinent, put to death. Fierabra converts at the point of a sword and only after he's been seriously wounded. Whereas the Saracens actually impose no such choices. Um, we know that historically, uh, well, they sometimes did, but a lot of times they didn't. And famously in the Quran, it says there shall be no compulsion in religion. People should convert out from, from their own desire, not at the point of a sword. But Charles the Great is uncompromising in demonstrating the triumph of the good Christian religion over the supposedly evil Muslim faith. At the heart of Charles the Great are the two converts, Floripas, he calls her Floripes, and her gigantic brother, Fierabra, both children of the villainous Balan, here renamed Balant. Floripas' presence is enormously enhanced and expanded in a work whose episodic prose style developed characters and what we would now call human interest recall those of Sir Thomas Mallory's Mort Darthur, The Death of Arthur, which is about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And actually that was published in the same year as Charles the Great, 1485, and also by William Caxton. So um, that's interesting that the two the styles are so similar. While in Sir Ferenbras and the Southern of Babylon, the love story remains a relatively minor element. In Charles the Great, as in the Mort, Mort Darthur, romantic love is a motivating force for much of the action. The character of Floripas is developed to make her into a complex woman, and the love story between her and Guy de Bourgogne is greatly amplified in comparison with the other two stories. Floripas' role as comforter and solver of problems is also intensified compared with that in the other two works, and she's even more central to the narrative, with aspects of the Virgin Mary about her. 
and later Muslim heroines who convert to Christianity, such as those of the Spanish author Miguel de Cervantes. <clears throat> we know him from uh, Don Quixote mostly, but he did write a lot of other novels and plays. His heroines who convert to Christianity are inspired by the Virgin Mary and use her as a model for behavior and religious worship. The depictions of Floripas person and her chamber are also more elaborate than in the previous works. The initial description of her beauty takes up 39 prose lines as compared with just a few words in Sir Fernbrust and the description of her naked when she's baptized at the end of Charles the Great takes up 20 lines of sensuous and in places even lubricious prose compared with the eight lines of verse in Sir Fernbrust. Her courtly manners are emphasized. She's described as courteous Flor Floripas, notwithstanding that she was not christened, had so great a noblesse and so great a compassion. But her courtesy is inconsistent, for when she volunteers to save the knights from her father, she makes it clear in this version of the story that she is only doing so for love of Guy de Bourgogne. For Guy's sake, she's ready to convert to Christianity, not because she's so attracted to the religion, but only on condition that she can have him for a husband. The knights readily agree, but as in Sir Ferenbras, Guy is reluctant and at first says he will only marry Floripas if the Emperor Charlemagne will give her to him. At this, she swears that if he will not marry her, she will have them all hanged. Roland presses Guy, who then agrees to take her as his wife. At this, Floripas kisses Guy and promises to convert to Christianity after all. Even so, the old religion still has a hold on Floripas, and at one point she turns back to it and tries to persuade the knights to convert to Islam too. Guy and another knight destroy two of the idols, and Floripas is again persuaded to give up her gods and accept Christianity. Just as the love interest between Floripas and Guy is enhanced, so too are other elements of the plot to which some dramatic and prurient elements have been added. Floripas reveals that she was to have been forcibly married to her cousin Lucifer, Lucifer, Satan, right, whom Guy defeated in the joust at Rome. Lucifer bursts unannounced into her chamber where she's sheltering the French prisoners and one of the knights kills him. On another occasion she's threatened with rape when a, another Saracen called Marpin, Marvin, breaks into her chamber and attacks her. Guy hears her cries, runs to her aid and cuts the man down with his sword. And it's around about this time that Guy evidently begins to develop feelings for his bride-to-be as he becomes increasingly protective of her and several times rescues her from disaster as when he sees her. Uh, saves her from rape. Now can you see we're witnessing the beginning of a role reversal and a rebalancing of power back to what I suppose they would have considered as the norm with the man now in the ascendant and the woman more subser subservient and dependent on him. In another scene he kisses her passionately and in yet another scene Floripas adopts a conventional womanly role when from a window she watches Guy fighting in a scene resembling a medieval joust where the beloved but physically inactive woman encourages her man to win. And here you can see a scene of a joust, 1470 to 1472, close to the time of uh, the translation and publication of Charles the Great. Two heavily armed knights on horseback brand brandishing their lances and up above the women spurring them on and willing their particular man to succeed and they may be wearing uh, a color worn by one of the knights or the knight might be their knight might be wearing a color associated with them but in any case all they can do is watch and pray and hope they have no uh, no place in the action as such. More questionably, from a modern perspective, when the men think they can't escape from the castle in which they're besieged, Floripas gives each of them one of her maidens to take at his pleasure. She doesn't ask the maiden's permission, she just makes the offer 
in a spirit of carpe diem, you know, seize the day and to give the knights courage. So uh, quite, a, quite a, a difference there, I think. At the end, Floripas has her reward for her conversion and steadfast fast support for the Frankish and Christian cause when she's baptized and married to her lover, Guy de Bourgogne. They are crowned King and Queen of Spain jointly to rule with Fierabra. Now, I think that's quite interesting because in the other two, she is not going to share in the, the, the ruling of Spain. The, the, the crown is divided between the two men, uh, Fierabra or Ferenbras and, um, and Guy de Bourgogne. And here she's to rule jointly. And I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that just a few years before in 1479, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella were jointly crowned king and queen of Spain and ruled together. So again, at the end of the story, uh, Floripas hands the relics over to Charlemagne. So as we've seen in both Christian texts and Muslim texts, warrior women abound and are seen as tough and ruthless, especially in the pursuit of love. As for Floripas, what are we to make of her? She's a woman of powerful contradictions. She has an iron will, as uh, one of the narrators asserts. It is great folly to disregard the will of a woman when she sets her mind to something that her heart desires and takes no regard to the consequences, but only that she might succeed in her enterprise. Floripas thought of nothing except that she might have certain news of Guy de Bourgogne, to whom she'd given her heart and was content to be christened for the love of him. As we've seen, Floripas is always at the center of the action, repeatedly providing strategies and solutions, some of them quite ingenious, to a variety of problems and never losing her nerve. She's in spirit a warrior, as well as a sort of mascot. At the same time, as protector and comforter of men in trouble, she has aspects of the Virgin Mary, one of whose roles was thought to be as a protector of captives. One of Floripa's editors, Sidney Hertage, describes her as handsome, but certainly undutiful to her father and an exceedingly strong-minded young lady. Well, we've seen that, haven't we? At other times, he says her naturally soft disposition shows itself. To my mind, evidence that Floripas has a naturally soft disposition is really strikingly lacking in these tales, even though she does adopt a much meeker stance at the end of the stories, once she's got what she wants and, of course, become a Christian. Also, to say that she's an undutiful daughter is a euphemism at, le at the very least, wouldn't you agree? The inference is that she's fierce and violent in relation to the Saracens, on whom she's so vehemently turned her back, and meek and womanly toward the Christians whose cause she's joined, and as a Christian wife. In many ways, Floripas reminds me of the Greek sorceress Medea, who killed her brother and scattered his body parts in order to delay her father's pursuit of her and her lover, Jason. And also she famously murdered her own children. And there you can see uh, an ancient amphora showing Medea stabbing her young son. The difference, of course, is that Medea remains violent to the very end in what is undeniably a tragedy. This is, I think, a comedy, you know, in the original sense of the word, having a happy ending. The function of the tower, which so often in myth and literature, including the two romances discussed above, is the locus of the woman's incarceration, here unites men and woman in confinement, as well as being a place of refuge. In other respects, the kinship between Muslim and Christian, which is obvious in several other medieval romances that I haven't spoken about here, but which are very, very interesting in that regard, is at first missing from the Chanson de Geste. But especially in Charles the Great, man and woman grow together slowly in the nexus of battle, in the close confines of the tower, and through common cause 
And the inference is that their marriage will be a happy one, I think. And here you have a picture of a medieval marriage, a French marriage, Louis de Blois and Marie de France, again from around about the same time as uh, the writing, of the translation, printing, I should say, of Charles the Great, 1480 to 1483. Remember that Charles the Great is 1485. Some commentators argue that Floripas is being disparaged by her author and by inference, her readers or her audience, but I don't agree. She lived in violent times in a very Christian society. And I think her author and his contemporaries would have seen killing Saracens, Muslims, in the service of Christianity, perfectly acceptable and even admirable. A final word on the survival of the Muslim Christian love story inspired by two 15th and 16th century Italian revisions and enlargements of the Chanson de Roland into modern times. Um, in the summer of 2019, not long before our first lockdown, my partner Paul and I were on holiday in Palermo, Sicily, and we chanced to discover a Sicilian tradition, puppet shows dramatizing the adventures of the Frankish knights Orlando, Roland, Roland, and Rinaldo, who, although cousins and friends, are fierce rivals in love for the Saracen princess Angelica. And there you can see uh, the, the uh, puppet shows. On the left is uh, a leaflet, which we picked up and took, brought home. You can see one of the knights there with his headgear on. Opera dei Pupi, uh, a, a work about dolls or puppets. Teatro Argento was the name of the company. On the right, a picture I took of a scene in the action. And you can see at the top, the very ornate proscenium at the bottom, uh, also very vivid uh, painting underneath the stage. And in the middle, the action with the two knights on the right hand side, one of them clutching his shield, both heavily armed um, and they're fighting, watching them. On the left and in the background is Princess Angelica, very beautifully dressed in blue satin trousers and an embroidered jacket with elaborate headgear. And the knights fight on and on. In fact, most of the puppet show is about the knights fighting and the little boys in the audience absolutely love that. Uh, clashing their swords and the whole thing is very, very noisy. Uh, but actually, it turns out they're fighting in vain because Angelica is not in love with either of them. She's in love with somebody else. Thank you. Ava, thank you so much for your really interesting presentation with the beautiful illustrations as well that you brought us. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Okay. I'm sure everyone liked it. Um, so what I'll do now, Eva, is I will open the chat and look for the questions that may have come in. Um, okay, so let me see. Um, there is... Um, there's a comment from Sue Pearl saying Lewis's picture seems to have been painted in Sir Frederick Layton's house. Um, I'll have a look. I don't. Um, it's exactly like his house, his Muslim, his Islamic room in his house. Uh -huh. Oh, Lewis's picture. Um, I don't know. I mean, there is a, there is a, um, some people uh, say that uh, it was painted in his own apartments. You know, he lived in Cairo for a long time. And one of the attributions of the setting is, is uh, to his own, 
a place of residence in Cairo. So I don't know about Frederick Layton, but it's, uh, as I said, it's been interpreted as a harem scene by a number of commentators. I think it just illustrates the richness of the house of somebody who's, you know, very well healed and with very good taste. Okay, um, I have a question from Sarah Boyce, um, who says, many thanks for an interesting lecture. And could you please recommend some history books about powerful women in Islam? Oh, right. Well, I, I, I can't do more than recommend Remka, Pro, uh, Remka Crook's uh, book, The Warrior Women of Islam. Uh, she, she talks about all the... Um, Arab um, epic stories uh, featuring a whole lot of um, warrior women. Uh, there's one story uh, about a, a woman who, I, I said in my talk, I think that they begin their lives as tomboys. There's one story about a woman who's actually brought up as a boy for various reasons. And she's, her parents dress her in male costume and um, she uh, lives life uh, known by the name of Amr, AMR, and um, only as an adult she comes out, as it were, in her female persona as Princess Ramra. And she is, she's fierce in the extreme. She falls madly in love with her cousin, you know, in all these stories. The thing to do was to love your cousin and preferably to marry your cousin and uh, the, uh, some of the stories, long, long stories talk about cousins separated but they still remain their own true loves and they come back together at the end. So she falls in love with her cousin and sends word that she wants to marry him and he thinking he's never seen her, not realizing that she's female. He just says, no, he's not interested. All he wants to do is hunt and fight and stuff like that. She is so offended that uh, he won't marry her that she goes to find him in her male gear and she fights him and she overcomes him and she completely humiliates him. She forces him to take off his clothes, some of his clothes she takes off herself. The one thing he doesn't want to take off is his trousers. And she says, no, you've got to take everything off. So he takes off his trousers as well. And um, she leaves him completely naked in the middle of nowhere and goes off. And this humiliation, paradoxically, one might say, causes him to fall madly in love with her. <laughs> and then he wants to marry her. By that time, she's had enough. She doesn't want to marry him anymore. And uh, then she's sort of forced to marry him by the ruler. And uh, so she marries him. But on the wedding night, she ties him up and takes her leave and gallops off uh, to live in somewhere else completely, uh, leaving him to, you know, do whatever. So that's a typical warrior heroine. But Remka Crook has a very, very fine um, uh, d description and summary of a lot of those stories. I can't think of any more at the moment, but if you want to leave your email address with the college, uh, I will happily see if I can find some others. That's great. I, mean, also the I, oh, I should just say also the texts, the story of that al when it comes out, will have a a very useful introduction. Um, the, 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 the Christian ones also, Fierabra and Floripa showed the cover of that. That has a very useful introduction. And um, uh, almost anything, any of the texts you can read will have a good introduction uh, about the stories and about warrior women included. Okay, thank you, Eva. Um, for the audience, I also put the reference to uh, Remke Kruk's book in the chat so they can find that there. Um, I have a, a further question from Rehab Khalid, who asks if in your reading you had the impression that the gender of the author 
had any bearing on how the Muslim female warrior is portrayed in the stories? I hate to say this, but I think most of the authors are men. <laughs> I mean, there may be exceptions and perhaps I can find one, but the stories I've talked about today, the authors are men. And, and sadly, uh, a lot of the audiences were men or mainly men as well. But um, I, I, it's interesting, the warrior women had a fascination for men. And I've, as I've said, um, you, you know, I mean, Abrisa uh, repeatedly overcomes Shah Khan and he falls in love with her precisely when she is overcoming him. And I mean, overcoming him in the course of the fight, not just overcoming him because you know, she's beautiful and so forth, but actually um, physically defeating him and putting him in a position where he could easily have been killed had she been so minded. So, yeah, there's something about these women that the men just like. Fascinating, isn't it? I mean, in later literature, you get heroines being demure and feminine and that being the ideal, but it wasn't always so. Really interesting. Um, I think we might have time for one more question, Eva, and then we'll have to wrap it up. But just for all of you who have put questions in the chat, we will keep these and um, forward them to Eva so that she can answer them individually. I'll just ask you the one last question from Catherine Peters who says the attention to the beauty and naked bodies of these heroines is so out of line with what I see as the official line of Christianity and Islam, which tends to be much more prudish and averse to attention drawn to the female body. How would you explain this discrepancy? Uh, it's a paradox. I mean, in a way it shows you the hypocrisy, doesn't it? Um, I was looking up to see, you know, who who wrote these stories. A number of them are by that well-known author, Anonymous. Um, but uh, some of them, it's known who wrote them. And some of them, there are speculations on who wrote them. And also, I thought somebody might ask me, who were the people who read and listened to the stories if they were told? There's a strong, the Christian ones anyway, there's a strong connection with the church. And there's a, a, a suggestion that some of these stories were actually written by, cl by clergymen. And I can only, again, go back to this, you know, the idea of the hypocrisy and also the, the, the fact that the stories were meant for um, wider consumption. They weren't only for, uh, you know, the aristocracy and the, uh, and the religious, they were, they were the main purpose of them was to uh, in the Christian ones, I think, to bring people closer to Christianity, to remind them of their duties mm. as Christians. And similarly, I would say with the Muslim ones, because there too, the Muslim re religion is emphasized and repeatedly Christians are portrayed. If they're not heroines who convert, they're portrayed as rather reprehensible. There's one uh, elderly unattractive Christian in that Alhima who is a she's a sorceress or something and she's uh, performs evil deeds through the story and she ends up being crucified at the gates of the city and you know as in the Christian stories Christianity is extolled and everyone is being pushed to uh, adhere to Christianity and be more fervently Christian the Muslims are being pushed to be more fervently Muslim. But these little descriptions of the women are uh, icing on the cake, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> or the sugar coating, I should say, the sugar coating. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm really sorry, but I think we'll have to wrap it up now. It's um, just past seven o'clock. But um, we cannot let you go, Eva, without saying thank you once again for an absolutely fabulous talk and wonderful illustrations. It's given us a lot of food for thought. Um, a lot of people have expressed their thanks in the chat. And so I'll just express that for you. 
once thank again. You. Thank you very much, Henriette. And thanks also to Ella, Ella Barrett, who has been uh, organizing. Thank you to both of you who've been supporting me and uh, making all the arrangements so that I didn't have to. You're most welcome. Okay, and audience, I wish you all a very pleasant evening and we hope to see you very soon at our next talk. Thank you for being here. Again. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>